office journalism concept. It's called economy. Now this is the one topic I believe we, we all watch, but we don't really know what it's about. If you think about what you watch right now, we watch gas prices, we watch milk prices, food prices, we, we watch prices of everything. It's all driven by the economy. So we're going to look and see exactly what the economy means. Before we begin, let's just do a quick recap of what we have talked about with various business journalism concepts. The first one, of course, we looked at the history of BizJ News, and then we also talked about public and private companies and what the differences are between those. Um, we had some attention placed on the SEC, and no, this is not the Southeastern Conference. We're talking about the Securities and Exchange Commission, as well as some other regulatory agencies that can be of benefit to us as business journalists when we are trying to investigate and research uh, companies and trends for our stories. And then we looked at various business beats, um, for instance, like the retail beat, um, even medical. Um, we, we looked at a number of those. So, what drives the economy? Well, let's begin first by talking about what the economy is. Uh, a good definition of the economy can be this activities surrounding the production and distribution of goods and services for consumption in a region. So, the way that prices are marked in our region, for instance, in West Kentucky, as well as maybe just generally in the um, southeastern part of the country, those prices are going to be different than those, say, on the West Coast. Okay, so the economy, while we do look at it from a national perspective, we can also look at it from a regional perspective and, and gain an understanding that way. Um, an example of just the way the economy works, you know, we pay people to either make something or maybe even do something, but, you know, let's just for uh, simplicity's sake, let's just say that people are paid to make something and that something is then sold and then consumers buy that something. Well, then the economy grows. So it's very cyclical, okay? So there's just a nice cycle that, that goes on, and we want that cycle to uh, always be um, building, growing. However, the um, reverse of growth, of course, is decline, reduction, and so that can also be part of the economy. So when the economy slows or declines, there's not a demand for a product or for a service. And as such, then people, the workers, are either laid off or they might be fired, and we do see some of that. Now, when we watch the economy, of course, it's important for us, you know, as consumers for our pocketbooks, but let's look at it from a standpoint um, as to those who really work in the economy. Um, company managers, they watch various economic indicators. The reason why is because they don't want to have too much inventory sitting in their warehouses. If they've got too much inventory sitting in their warehouses, then that means that probably people might not be buying off the shelf, so they can't move off their inventory from their warehouse floor into stores. So we, they have to watch it that way. Likewise, we've got to make sure that we have enough on hand so that way when they are selling very well and they're selling off the shelves, then we are able to replace that quickly so that we can still uh, make dollars, uh, make money as, as much as possible and as quickly as possible. So company managers are really interested in the economy. Investors are interested in the economy too. Um, they're the ones who are going to decide whether to buy stock in a company. So if a company thinks that the economy will grow, Production generally then increases and then more goods are sold, and that means more revenue and profit. So that's why investors really watch it. And there are various groups that watch the economy, and these are the groups that we're going to be talking about in the next few moments. But the Federal Reserve Board, um, which is made up of um, various, it's a panel that watches the economy, and then they make recommendations to, um, to our federal authorities as to whether interest rates should go up or down. So whenever you hear news reports about uh, the feds are looking to either keep interest rates um, steady or to, um, or to raise them, it's because they're, they're concerned about, inter when we say interest rates, we're talking about interest rates on um, more of consumer credit, 
Um, we'll be talking about that in just a second too, but you know, for credit cards, home mortgages, auto loans, things like that. So these groups watch the economy and they examine companies' production, they look at the inventory, they look at orders and shipping, again, they look at consumer confidence, they, they look at a number of factors, probably more so than company managers do or than investors do. And then the Federal Reserve Board, they will issue reports. And those reports are, are basically made to the public as to um, what um, they expect to see in the economy and what projections they might have as far as um, any uh, rate increases that they might be proposing. So when we're trying to make sense of the economy as a business journalist, this is kind of what we're doing here. We have to understand first that businesses in one region may be increasing production, but you're going to have some in another that may be decreasing. And that's why it helps to just watch, in a lot of ways, what local businesses are doing. So they're going to be somewhat the barometer um, as to what might be going on in other places or even nationally. So spotting trends is very key in this. Um, the example here I have that the 2008-2009 recession, many of you probably either knew that from your, about with your parents, maybe you might have experienced some conversations in the house, or those of you who um, have been on your own or you do raise a family, then you, you might recall this recession. And some of you might have parents or might know people who are now pulling themselves out of it. But the recession at the time was caused, we had rising credit card debt, um, increase in home loans, and we had a decline then in the housing market. So we had all this going on, and then all of a sudden it just bottomed out is what, it, what happened. Um, so we as reporters need to gauge different parts of the economy, and we look at various economic barometers in doing so, and that's what we're going to be talking about here. So when, when you hear the term economic barometers, it's referring to these different classifications, uh, these different factors. Inflation, unemployment rate, which many of you have heard of, um, productivity, consumer credit, which I mentioned earlier, uh, auto and home sales, I've also mentioned that, international trade, which we generally, um, um, unless you are maybe a national business journalism reporter, uh, you, you might not look too much at that, but again, if something has happened internationally, it could affect things back at home and then consumer confidence. So let's just briefly examine each one of these factors. So inflation. If you've taken an economics course, you probably recognize this term. So we're just talking about price levels of goods and services. If inflation is on the rise, then the cost of goods and services for us um, consumers, it's going to go up. So if inflation rises, then that's not a good thing for us. Um, so let's apply this if we wanted to do a story on inflation. Um, Grocery stores, again, a good example. Um, even maybe convenience stores that, that uh, offer fuel. So, you know, we look at those and we are trying to, again, determine the impact that it has on consumers. Remember, we're writing for the readers. So readers want to know how is this going to impact them? How will it affect them? Okay, so we, we're going to use numbers, of course, but we also want to find consumers who have been affected by inflation. Those will make good stories. People want to relate to somebody else's story. Okay. Um, unemployment rate. Basically, this is just a percentage of the labor force that does not have a job, but is looking for work. So this is not everybody who just doesn't have a job, because some people don't, don't work. They don't have to work, or maybe they choose to stay at home. But so when we say unemployment rate, we're only talking about those who don't have a job, but are looking for work. Well, how is that determined? Well, they file a claim basically through the unemployment office, and that's collected. Um, all, all the different stats are collected for the country and for each state by the Bureau of Labor St Statistics, and so each state has pretty much a similar office like that. Um, these reports come out the first Friday of the month. So we've already had, today is, um, well, rather than putting a date on this because I don't know when you might listen to this um, recording, but the first Friday in March, for instance, the unemployment rate uh, report came out. And unemployment is uh, steadily declining, basically. So uh, the stories here that we normally do, um, of course, we're always waiting for those reports, so those are very helpful to us. So 
we want to look at our rates, say for West Kentucky, and we want to see if we're doing better or worse than the rest of the country. Okay, um, it does not necessarily mean that if we're doing better than the rest of the country might be suffering. That's not really what we're what we're seeing, but we're wanting to see if we are still part of a trend. Really, we're hoping to see if the country is doing better that we're doing better too. That's really what we're wanting to see. Productivity. This measures how the workforce is producing goods, and this can be thought of in a lot of ways as a mathematical equation. So really, you know, output over input, uh, the goods and services produced or offered um, over the number of worker hours. So, you know, we want to be able to keep, in other words, we're wanting to keep the bottom line down so that way our um, profit bottom line can go up. That's really what productivity is. So uh, the higher the productivity level, then the more efficient companies are in producing goods while holding down cost. Okay, so that's what we talk about when we're saying productivity. Holding down all the cost associated with making that product um, as well as other related and associated cost. And then hopefully our productivity level is high to where we are selling uh, a good number of goods or we're getting our services out. Consumer credit, um, this is where the Federal Reserve Board really tracks consumer credit and they also issue monthly reports. Um, so here's what they're looking at. They, they do look at credit card usage. Um, so if, they're, if they are seeing a trend that consumers are using their credit cards more and more to make purchases, when you're relying on credit cards, that usually means one thing, that you have a cash flow problem in your, in your household budget. So if you are relying on credit cards to either make purchases or make ends meet, then that means you have a cash, cash flow issue. And what does that translate to? Well, then you're probably going to have some difficulty in paying off those bills later. And when that happens, that does hurt the economy. But like I said, this is more about a trend. This trend did pretty much occur during the 2008-2009 recession. We saw more reliance on credit cards. As a result, we saw more and more people who were not able to make their payments. And it, it kind of, it really hurt the economy around that time. Um, I have here on this third bullet, even though we have not gone through all of the economic barometers yet, but just know that um, each of these barometers can help create good stories about the economy. Um, but whatever numbers you use, you've got to make sure you explain to the reader what these numbers mean and explain to them some of the terminology. Not, not all readers are going to understand exactly what, say, for instance, productivity is or what consumer credit is. So you might have to explain it a little bit to them. And then you put a face to those numbers. You actually go out and do interviews with people who might be having, for instance, trouble paying off their credit card bills. You know, that way, let's put a store, let's, let's put some real life into these numbers, and that's what we're doing when we are doing business journalism stories. Consumer spending. When we say consumer spending, we're talking about auto and home sales. Now, these are the two of the biggest items tracked. Yes, there are other um, sales and other loans that are issued for other big purchases, but home and auto are the biggest ones because these two are influenced heavily by interest rates. So, individual automakers, and there's also a Federal Bureau of Economic Analysis, both of these release sales stats for cars and trucks at the end of every month. So they report how many they sold. Um, and then the Bureau of the Census tracks new home sales and they make those reports monthly. Okay. Um, vehicles generally um, are considered discretionary purchases. In other words, I mean, it's one of those you really don't have to have one. There are other ways of getting around for the most part, but they are discretionary purchases. And when the number of vehicle sales, when the vehicle sales are up, that can give some sort of indication on consumer behavior, just like if they were down. But if sales were up, then that basically means consumers are happy with their jobs, they're comfortable with the way things are going, they feel like they're, they've got a great future. Um, if we don't see many vehicles being sold, then you know that's an indication that consumers might be worried about how the economy is, and they don't think taking on another, whether it be a car loan or a car lease, might be the best thing right now. Um, for home sales, local numbers, definitely. These are more valuable to your readers than national figures, again, because the home markets are different. Uh, a house sold in Murray, Kentucky is going to have a different price if you, if you took that very same home and put it in Los Angeles, California. In fact, it will probably be three times the sales price 
in LA. So you've got to really just look at mostly just local numbers or regional numbers, but don't ever really try to compare a home sale um, in your local community to one across the country. It just will not work. International trade. These, this is a barometer that you might not um, focus on too much, but again, We've got to remember if it has any tie to anything in our local economy, it's something to watch. Um, so trade surplus and trade deficit are the two terms we're talking about when we are looking at international trade. When we say trade surplus, it just means that U.S. exports more goods than it imports. Okay, And then a trade deficit, the U.S. imports more goods than it exports. So remember, if you can remember exports and imports, exports, we are shipping out, imports are coming in. So when we have a surplus, then we are um, shipping out a lot of goods, which is great. That's, you know, kind of what we want, but it's doing so more than we are bringing in from other countries. Um, if we have a deficit, it means we are bringing in more than we are um, sending out, and that's not really what we want to have. Um, the Commerce Department measures international trade, and again, monthly reports are issued uh, on imports and exports by various industries. Um, the international trade barometer is important for businesses and workers to know um, how, sex, how successful they have been in selling their goods to countries overseas. So that, that's why it's really important to them. Coca-Cola, for instance, is one company. Uh, in which more than half of their business is overseas. So it's not just an American product. We see, you know, various commercials. Of course, they're known around the world as, you know, the number one beverage. So um, they, they like to know how the trade surplus or deficit is, is doing. Consumer confidence is a barometer that is um, tied to a number of various economic factors. And the reason why is because if consumer confidence is high, then people are going to spend money. And if their confidence in the economy is low, then they're not going to buy things. So that's really what it boils down to. Um, so if, if, if their confidence is high, then um, you know they're probably going to work harder so that productivity will be up. Um, they're going to maybe make that or, or pay off, um, or excuse me, or buy a new car. And therefore, you know, there's another auto loan or auto lease that's going to gain some interest. Um, so that's why it's tied to a number of economic factors. Uh, there are two um, entities that look at consumer confidence levels. One is the conference board and then the other is the University of Michigan. Um, they have a center that uh, for various economics that they they look at these barometers and they release consumer confidence reports every month. So basically what they do, they just poll people um, to measure consumer sentiment. And they're asking questions like, do you plan on buying a vehicle in the next six months? Do you plan on buying a new home in the next six? It's just things like that. So that way they can try to measure consumer confidence. Now, um, when I taught this class on site, um, I would have students try to tell me who these individuals are. Now, likewise, since we are online, I, I, of course, can't receive your feedback, but I'll just go ahead and explain to you. All of these, at one time or now, um, have served as chair of the Federal Reserve Board, and we're going to talk about the Federal Reserves in just a few moments. So, the individual beginning on the left side of the slide, that's Alan Greenspan. He held the position of chair from around the late 80s to sometime, it was about uh, kind of almost the early to mid 2000s. I want to say it was about 2005, 2006 possibly. He retired and then the individual in the middle, Ben Bernanke, he was the chair of the Federal Reserves. He took over Greenspan's role and he served in, as chair up until 2014. And then the individual on the right, is Janet Yellen. She is now the chair of the Federal Reserve Board and she is the first female chair of the Federal Reserve Board. So she she and a panel they look at all the various economic barometers and they make reports as to what they feel the economy is going to do. Uh, they, they look at a number of economic forecasts. It's, it's a lot of um, a lot of data crunching, a lot of data analysis, um, a lot of 
um, watching the, the economy. So there's, there's a lot taken into consideration before various reports are made as to what they plan to do with the interest rates. But they are very powerful people. In fact, I would venture to say that the chair of the Federal Reserve is probably the most powerful person in the nation next to, um, next to the president. The chair of the Fed steers the economy. Um, again, they, the chair receives all the information from, a, from the panel, um, as well as from other re, the reports, other agencies, and they are, they are the captain of the economic ship. Um, the Federal Reserve was created in 1913. It is the country's central bank. Okay. Um, the Federal Reserve is made up of seven members known as the Board of Governors. Each of the members is appointed by the President, so this is a federal appointment. And their appointment must be confirmed by Congress, and each of the members serve a 14-year term. The primary responsibility of the Federal Reserves is to set the country's monetary policy. Um, and it's all designed to stimulate economic growth without causing too much inflation. Okay. Inflation is always going to be there, but we don't want it to rise enough to where it's going to cause Americans and businesses to suffer. So the Federal Reserve controls the economy's money flow and the available credit as well. Then you have the Federal Open Market Committee. All right. Now, the committee is made up of the Fed board, so you have the seven individuals, and then you have other members, about five of them, and each of those serves as president of a regional Federal Reserve Bank. And these members serve on a rotating basis. Um, and so the banks are divided. You know, you may have, you know, somebody from Philadelphia and Chicago and Denver and New York at one point, and then it'll rotate out to where you bring in the other uh, presidents from the other reserve banks, Richmond, Atlanta. And so it just rotates on and off like that. Now, the committee meets eight times a year to discuss the state of the country's economy and whether to take action. So if economic growth is slowing, then it might lower interest rates, so that way it, it gives Americans some confidence in that they can still make monthly payments on whatever, maybe their credit cards or auto loans or home loans, etc. Um, and then also these lower interest rates are good for banks to use and lending institutions to use to promote um, to hopefully their, their customers as well as attract new customers, all designed to stimulate spending. If we can get people to spend money, then it helps with the economic growth. So the Feds basically tell where the economy is, is headed with their monetary policy. So like I said earlier, they're constantly looking at trends and all the economic barometers that we discussed. Although unemployment rate and inflation are where their largest concentration is. Um, the feds present a report on the economy to Congress twice a year. Uh, at that time, the chair um, basically testifies before Congress based on the report. Um, and this um, is common for any of the stock indexes to rise or fall based on the feds' comments. So a lot of times stock markets, when, when it's... Um, approaching that the, the Fed's chair is getting ready to issue its re, um, issue a report as to what the Feds might recommend and might do, um, then that's where we see action with the stock market. If investors feel confident in the report, then they're probably going to invest and, and the stock market's going to be fine. But if we're going to find some problems, then they, they may not trade as much on that day. In fact, um, trades and, and purchase of shares will, will be stagnant. Okay, so that is it on the economy. Um, I hope you have learned a little bit of something and that maybe the next time you read business stories um, or that you look at them, you'll have a, more of a greater understanding as to what is being discussed in the story. Likewise, I hope the next time you observe the, the fuel prices rising, which they're slightly increasing inch by inch, or that you, you buy you know, your next gallon of milk or when you're buying bread, that you're, you're taking greater care in examining what those prices might mean. Okay, So I hope this was helpful for you. And um, like always, if you have any questions, please contact me. Thank you.